kind hearts and nanotech. One may have heard tell of magnets that stick to arms, post seed. One might assume this to be to be fake, fake news, but this is an artifact of the delivery method as this 2018 article of uh, molecular pharmacy, uh, iron oxide nanoparticle based vaccine delivery, in this case for cancer treatment. And others, here's one dating back uh, from 2017. To be sure, this is before today's data nullification, so maybe someday we won't be able to see such things. The censorship reduction in pharmaceutical scholarship that works invisibly like a shadow ban, cancelling not only people one doesn't like, but publications about which one would like not to hear, nullifying or disappearing data points. This is an actual film telling you a little, little YouTube video telling you how to do that, to massage data sets quite as one would have them be. Nullification is the technical name for a technique used by big pharma because it's all about coding and prepping the safety data to reduce untoward implications by nullifying. That's the app, the data that doesn't fit their product before submitting regulatory reports. This, this is what this is all about to government authorities. This is like, like correcting, fixing, adjusting your lab results before submitting them for a grade or a grant application. Thus, many of us today are rather literal cyborgs in just this nano sense, but not, of course, in Donna Haraway's romantic sense, or as Mark J. Cockleberg reminds us even more romantically of Mary Shelley. Others like Langdon Winner have also reminded us, but Mark's more timely as he says in his title, It's New. Thus, we are nano enhanced or just encrusted about which perhaps Haraway, being a biologist, should have written, she could have, though that was not the tack she took. Today's new vaccines, here we have a more recent discussion of that, promise to be the standard for everything medical, including nanotech delivery components. And nanoparticles are part of the special swabs. Uh, these aren't ordinary swabs. Only certain nano-prepared swabs can be used for your PCR test, which were we really meeting in Lille, all of us might have had to get just to be able to speak to one another, and which some of us have been getting regularly for everyday reasons like teaching on campus or going to work. The next generation of high tech tests, there's a slide here, so they inform us include nano components just to help, what's the language here, reduce false negatives, as they say. Beyond medical delivery, nanoparticles are in the air. They are all around what we're breathing uh, from all kinds of sources, garden variety pollution, but also the constant geoengineering, which because it's constant, tends to be ignored like so much background noise. And of course, these particles dispersed from factories and labs everywhere are in the water and in the soil. Smart dust, that's where we were, can be inhaled. As I say elsewhere in a May 2020 keynote for the American University of Paris, anything that can be inhaled can be injected, and the latter is more efficient. At issue are tiny perpetual motion machines, just flows, the science called rayology, using surface tension along with surfactant deployed interaction. Everyone should have read, I, I really think this, Silly Boy's 1890s, very old book, on soap bubbles when they were a kid, and if you haven't, you should. Crucial as this particular book is a complement to Goethe's and Newton's studies of light and Kladni Sanpatris's music involved, see the tuning for as nano worms, you can see them there. And indeed, as thera grippers, rather like a fabric snap, like the similarly nano size quantum dots QD, quantum dots. Sarah Gripper, another way of thinking about these, of the sort, invented by Johns Hopkins Professor Florian Selahu to deliver a vaccine. And there, as we know, 
are many ways to do that. The man in the white suit. Alexander McKendrick's 1951, The Man in the White Suit, satirizes the relation between labor and factory ownership and cliche meets cliche men and women, together with creative aspiration and techno science. Here's a hero, there he is, Sidney Stratton. Well, we see him hiding a Wizard of Oz style signifier behind the curtains provided by the delivery of a new electron microscope. The hero's know-how permits him to pass another kind of hiding, not as a scientist, which via his Cambridge University formation he was, but as a technician, which he also was of this explosive variety. He was an experimental scientist. Notice the smoke and notice the PPR or field helmets in this case and his injured, uh, wounded, it's very sad, uh, assistant, that's Guinness. It's his role as lab tech that gains him carte blanche as an experimenter, enabling him after a few explosive, once again, setbacks, duly corrected by a few seductions to invent the shining stain proof cloth of the film's title, including what Bruno Latour names an actant and Heidegger and everyone else would call a gestel, an experimental apparatus. Like the second century Lucian sorcerer's apprentice, note here the brooms that go nanobot-like of themselves, there's a dramatic fail such that the heroine and her speedster can rescue the hero again, and love can save the day. Now, smoke and mirrors, music and light. Tom McLeish explains rayology in his 2019 book, that's what my preprint is about, as including granular flows such as cascading sand, the delicate formulation of inks, paints, and other coatings, and biological fluids endowed with sticky, slimy, and stringy properties by their constituents. McLeish's triumphal story, The Poetry and Music of Science, complete with the mockery encounter. It seems you have to have a misunderstood founding father, the German chemist Hermann Staudinger, that's a quote, when he first proposed, still quoting, in 1922, the existence of what he called macromolecules. There he is with the macromolecules people made fun of him for. Now, I myself... I'm a fan, I prefer the story of Fritz Friedrich Adolf Panet and the mobility of ions, the thing that makes advanced organic and inorganic chemistry such a hurdle for pre-med students. It's not for want of material sympathy, however. Thus, the philosopher of chemistry, Bernadette, she's also speaking at this conference, Vincent Vincent, reminds us of the wonder and beauty of everyday things, as this often corresponds, as she explains to irrationals, the irrationals in chemistry incorporated in matter, let it be sugar and salt, quite as illuminated by the challenge, often ill met at the corner pub in pursuit of a hot whiskey, in the challenge that it can be, if you've forgotten your chemistry, to dissolve sugar in alcohol. Sugar easily dissolves in tea, that is, in water, in alcohol. It's a pain. But in McLeish's book on science, poetry, and music, written in the tradition of isn't nature wonderful, isn't science grand, not unlike Boy's 19th century soap bubble book, the worry is that science today suffers from bad press. Could we but correct this? Could we but see that science is, like art, a thing of creative achievement and beauty? Everything would be so much better. More than recognition, more than trusting science, as we are told, what's wanted is unquestioning enthusiasm. Well, unless it's, that's what I have here, a uh, lemon Italian ice in Brooklyn or your choice of gelato in Rome. Both cases, I would have to say, would have to presume that one's in the mood for the same, I cannot but wonder what happened to critical thinking, critical theory, questioning. But McKendrick's 1951 science film, It's on Polymers, no less, tells a tale of just such unquestioning enthusiasm. 
Alec Guinness's dedicated scientist resplendent in purity and innocence. The film illuminates unanticipated consequences as these inevitably haunt application. Think Immanuel Kant on the old saw that may be right in theory, but it won't work in practice. This science, like a scientist, is innocent. The flatness of its awareness of itself as of the broader implications of its ambitions is both the glory and the joke of the film. And it is this parodic element that makes it a morality tale. At the film's end, this is really once the suit has been invented, after all the hard parts, which McKendrick dedicated to the claims of monopoly capitalism and labor politics, these are obviously laborers, a far bigger clash than gen the generic, trivial, I think, fancy concerning a chasm between the two cultures of art and science turns out to be a battle between those who own the mills, let it be these guys, and those who work in the mills, that's not even Sydney, he's even less than that, we're going to be talk about that, as part of which collective schematism and conflict, scientists and academics in general rarely suppose themselves to belong. Here we should note, because there's always more than one moral to be told in any morality tale worth the name, from Aesop to Plato to La Fontaine, Guinness's erstwhile Cambridge fellow, that's the key to the film, what I just mentioned before, he doesn't work for them. He's not employed. He works gratuitously fired as he is repeatedly. He's not paid. Sidney Stratton insists on pursuing his work on his own dime, no less, to the horror of the collective unionizers who also live in the rooming house with him, the same, just so he lives with them saving money that he might continue his research, that is, his work, after being sacked, sneaking surreptitiously into the lab at a different mill, faking it, we remember that, until he makes it. Guinness plays his character with a passion absorbed by his art, with a certain Henry Jamesian thickness. Tom McLeish fancies James's reference to the tension of skating on a lake just when the ice is almost ready to melt the break. Near to cracking, it's still supporting at least that one skater for at least that one moment. For, for Henry James, this is die hard. Just so, Guinness plays his insensitivity to anything not part of that same absorption. He has in this sense, remember the skater on his cracking ice, all follow through. The ice may well fail behind him, but on his skates, oblivious to the consequences and to the crashing roar of the ice behind him. Remember Sydney's radioactive suit? Remember chemistry, polymers, ionization, radiation? It glows a bit, so others tell him. And seeming not to have noticed this, the scientist brushes it off, murmuring, on, on what evidence we might ask, that it should wear off, dissonant, as the point of his miracle fiber is that it ought never to wear at all. It's supposed to last forever. As McKendrick's film insists on this point, our boy scientist has zero feeling for the consequences of his invention in practice. This is 1950s style Sheldon in the Big Bang Theory, nor do we get, nor can we get, it's a film, and it's a startup in any case, it's only a one-off, a feel for the fabric invented by our white knight scientist. Guinness's industrial chemist synthesizing synthetic fibers is in love, like any inventor, not with the leading lady, think of Plato's Thomas mocking Poth, but with his invention still. To make the suit, it needs to be cut on a blowtorch jig. The fabric and the dialogue underscores this is as if cut from steel. Here we get the MacGuffin, as is formally said, a film studies at the level of Matthew McGonaghy. All right, all right. The man in the white suit never gets far enough to raise questions of the hand, the feel, the quality of the material, issues of comfort, quite as his fellow millworks check this out. 
even though the suit plays a role in a certain heroine on hero seduction. Yet another parallel to Sheldon, she, she comes on to him, he doesn't come on to her. Given the fabric's design flaw, fatal it is, as it turns out, unstable, disintegrating at the end. This disintegration entailed already there with the smoke and dust of Sydney's explosive research underscores the film's timeliness. Material elements of pollution persist and progress apace. Remember the gray goo and the nuclear waste. Matter is neither created nor destroyed, accumulating at sea and at other bodies of water in the soils, in the air. This includes all the bits of fiber discarded in manufacture quite as they have to be, washed on the drain, dumped in landfill, burnt in incinerators. The same with our one use one way masks or test kits or syringes, vials, you name it. A nation of addicts with the middens heap to match. Now we've had such materials for a long time, synthetic fibers and plastics long wanted for their durability. So just where do these supposedly non-destructible shreds all wind up? Such materials remain forever. That's the thing about matter, though they do indeed degrade, but that means that they break into smaller and smaller bits. This is how dispersants work in the wake of oil spills, although dispersal, chemical surfactants and such, correct excess amounts of the wrong chemical by breaking that slick into smaller elements of the same. These, if properly entangled, if absorbed, consumed, inhaled or injected, remain in animal and plant and human bodies as the body fat pop science tells us this, seems to exist not simply to save energy for another day, which may also be why it's very hard to lose weight, but to salt away contaminants, DDT, steroids, like phosphate, carcinogenic hormones, there's a list. Thus, many of these nanotech items are carrying bits, just as McLeish describes in his own account of how one might figure out how best to entangle them as one would wish. Well, where all the bits that fail in the effort to do that wind up down the drain in the air. And then as automatic machines, being what they are, they go over themselves and we can ask, where do they go? And we should really ask how we would ever know. The film concludes with a uh, love and a car chase with Sydney on foot. The man in the white suit is all about whiteness. Also, Parsifal, the film being about a certain virginity, key to the filmic genre of the science geek, to be sure. More saliently, the film foregrounds the allure and purity of science, creative and imaginative, even erotic. Thus, the heroine of the film, very crucial, Joan Greenwood, the industrialist's daughter, Daphne, sees the beauty of and in Alekinis's Sidney Stratton's rhapsodizing about long chain polymers. The lighting doesn't hurt either, but notice that Sidney tends to be more Sheldon uh, presaging distracted. At the end, there's a love triangle or two, the Jamesian turn of the screw, more ice skater style attention to with the instability of the miracle fabric itself disintegrating a perfect deus ex machina a reveal resolving and saving the film's own entanglements a good decade later in hollywood in america john ford will film who shot liberty violence on shooting the legend like the western as such the idea of a good deal of pop science and even professional science, techno science, is to show science in the right, wearing the white, never the black card. And that's why to this day, when we talk about technology, we try to stick to the positive. Questions or comments? Oh, welcome, Alec Guinness, 1914 to 2000.